be seated. I want to show you a couple pictures before we go to today's message. And this is a wonderful highlight from the last uh, few days uh, where Dane Havard and I were able to travel to Cambodia to do some training and celebrate with some men and women there that have been called by God to serve their community. And, and the first picture you're going to see is of Dane and myself as well as Sonny and his wife Kim and their two daughters, um, Rebecca, uh, we say Rebecca, they say Rebecca, and Angel, other two precious daughters, and uh, we had a great opportunity to spend some time uh, with them. And then one of the main highlights of the trip, if you go to the next picture, uh, this is a picture of me presenting to Sonny a certificate uh, in the name of Rabbit Creek Church, recognizing God's call upon his life as a pastor there. He's been serving, uh, he's never been officially ordained, and been called in the ministry in that way, and so when I handed it to him, he smiled, he looked back at me, he said, so, so am, I, am I a pastor now? And, and, and I said, certainly. Now, he was a pastor before that, but we wanted to celebrate with him in this victory. And so thank you for your prayers while you're gone. If, if I stumble on my words, I went to sleep about 2 in the morning. Uh, so I uh, ho hope that I'm with it this morning. But it was a wonderful opportunity uh, to gather. So continue to pray for Sonny and uh, his family as well as the other ministries there. Uh, it's an awesome opportunity to see God working in Cambodia. Uh, this morning I want to talk to you about contentment. I want to talk to you about what it is to be content with those things that you have. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy at all. Uh, to, to look at our situation and say, you know, enough is enough, uh, particularly in, in our culture. Now, if I could show you other pictures of where we went into the sl to some slum areas, and, and one of those slum areas, because uh, they don't have any place to live, they take over some free land, and that, and that free land happens to be a cemetery. And you'll see children's toys stacked on top of tombs, and, and you see children running in and out of these places of the dead, and now there's a living on top of the dead. And, and we, we see some areas there that you and I aren't familiar with, at least firsthand. We, most of us, in fact, none of us live in the situation that we saw just the last few days. But we still have to say, how do I find contentment, not just in what I have, but how my life is going? If you look at the Ten Commandments, the, the final commandment, uh, the final commandment in Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, listings of the same commandments, we know them as the Ten Commandments. And the Tenth Commandment is this, you shall not covet. Now it goes on to talk about it's particularly directed towards men, although it's broader than this, but original audience was men, and therefore it says you shall not covet uh, your neighbor's donkey or mule or anything else, but then it goes on to say you shall not long after covet your neighbor's wife. Now, we understand that these are very um, divine words, they're from God, and also very wise words. You stay away from that, and you're going to stay out of a lot of trouble. But I understand that the tenth one is very important, and one of the reasons it's so important is if you look at the commandments before that, 7, 8, and 9, you see something very interesting. Uh, 7 talks about you shall not commit adultery. 8 talks about the fact that you shall not steal or be a thief. And then you have the, the ninth, which, which tells us something. I have no idea what it, it, what it is right now. But if you keep the, anybody want to help me out there? That's a test, right? Trust me, number 9 is important. So number 10, it says covet, do not covet. Now if you keep number 7, if you keep number 10, keep your number 7, keep your number 8, and whatever 9 is, I promise you the rest of them are going to be easier. Because if you get 10 down, it's kind of the bookend. The first one is you shall have no other gods before me. Tenth one is you shall not covet. Still don't know what 9 is. <laughs> but somewhere in between you're going to say, look, if I keep God first and I'm happy with what I have, then that, that is where I can begin to have this journey with God that, that makes sense. That is where I can realize this is a life that God has given me, and I can rejoice in it. I want, I want you to think about three examples from Scripture, two from the Old, one from the New Testament, uh, to talk about how this is not working this morning, really. Let me get that there. Uh, the David, David, the Old Testament king, the second king of Israel, as a man who had so much, God had ordained him, God had sanctioned him, God had said to him, you will be my man, you will be my king, you will rule over my people. In fact, David, there will never be, this throne will never pass away. There will always be one in the name of David from now through eternity. But David, I want you to be content with your lot. And David is not. In a day where God allowed 
for whatever reason, a polygamous society, David was among those. But he had to have one more. And she looks, says he's walking around his kingdom, should have been off to war. He's not off to war. He sees a beautiful woman on top of her house, bathing as was her tradition. And he longs for her. He's not content. You have a man named Achan in the Old Testament as well. God has told the people that I want you to go into a land. I want you to go into a land and because you're my people and I want you to be a people unique to me. I, I, I want you to go into this land and take over. But here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to take of anything of these people because that is unclean. That is not something that you will take. And it, if, you don't, if you do take it, I will punish you. And Achan takes it. And because he's taken this, this loot for himself, the people of Israel suffer. He was not content. You fast forward to the New Testament, you find that God has called 12 disciples. And among the 12 is a man named Judas, Judas Iscariot. And Judas, we know from the context, is the one, he was, he was kind of the accountant of the group. And so he had access to money, he had access to what the people of the 12 disciples had. But yet he longed for more, and he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus, and he betrayed Jesus for a handful of coins. He lacked contentment. And so I want to ask you, and I want to challenge you today to think about, am I content with my lot? Am I actually happy with what I have? If, if you are married in a, in a wonderful relationship, or maybe not even, even wonderful at this point, but you're working on it, are you, are you content with what God has given you? If God has said you can have these things in life, but, but not these things in life, or are you okay with having these and not these? And God has given you a blessing financially, and maybe you look at someone else and say, wow, this is so much more than I have. Are you content with what you have? Uh, Paul talks to a man named Timothy about this. Timothy's a young man. And, and one of the things that Timothy is called to do is to pastor uh, to, to help lead a church. I've shared with you before that some great advice I had early on in my ministry from, from my pastor, Charles Wade, still consider my pastor, dear friend, wonderful man of God, pastor for many years, continues to reach out, although retired, into people's lives with the gospel. And I sat down with him early after my call in the ministry. I was in high school. I needed advice. I, I went to him, and we talked about education and seminary and further degrees and what that would look like and, and what it means to commit your life to Jesus Christ, not only as a personal Savior, but also as a, a servant of his. What, what does that look like? And I went into him. I said, what advice do you have? And some of you heard this. Let me say it again and pay attention to it, men, women, too. Just change the word here a little bit. But he said to me, here's what I want you to remember, Mark. You're going to be a pastor. Keep your hands off the women and keep your hands off the money. Keep your hands off the women, keep your hands off the money. Praise be to God, because of God's grace, I've done both. Except for one special woman here. That's in a whole other sermon. But I want to tell you something. When, when you start looking around at what you don't have instead of what you do have, it's going to be a problem. And so God talks to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, keep your hands off the money and the women, basically. He says so much more, but then he's telling Timothy, here's how you are to live in a life of contentment. Here's how you are to be a man after God's own heart. Here's how to be one who actually lives as God has called you to live. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For he brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I want you to think about, first of all, this, this second word, this pivotal word in the very first verse I read. And, and that is but godliness. But godliness, what, what is godliness? Godliness is a life lived in a pursuit of being like God. Not to try to be God. That's where Adam and Eve failed. 
Uh, not to try to take over God's throne, but, but to say here is what I need to do. I need to live as God has called me to live. But it's by no coincidence that Paul goes on, he adds to that. He says, but godliness with contentment. One scholar defined godliness as this. He says, godliness as a description of existence incorporates the human mind and heart with which faith and ethical decisions are made and the physical senses with which the human being engages the material and social world and produces a visibly Christ-like manner of life in it. Here is this holistic life living. Here is the way in which you say, I give God my heart, I give Heart, I give God my mind, and I also give God my social activities. I give him my social context. I give him everything. And this is what godliness looks like. You say, God, none of this that I have is really mine. It all belongs to you. And so as we look at this passage together, I want to look at what Paul's doing here. And, and I want to begin with his thesis statement. You know what a thesis statement is. It's a statement of your point. What point are you trying to make? What, what, what's your truth in a nutshell? Let me remind you what his thesis statement, and then we're going to unpack his, his rationale behind it. And, and then how do we live out that rationale? How do we actually live out this, this statement? And the first statement there again in verse 6, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. If you were to look up the word contentment in Webster's, at least my copy, the definition of being content is to be happy with one's lot. Happy with one's lot. Now, one's lot, what is that? Uh, that is the sum of what you possess. The sum of what you possess. From a Christian standpoint, what you possess is not what you own. It, it's, it's not yours. Uh, no, nothing is truly mine. If I'm a saved believer in Jesus Christ, I understand that everything is the Lord's. Lord takes, Lord gives, and I can go before him and say, God, here it is. I, I can't piece, piece, uh, take my, my life and to put it in pieces and say, God, I'll give you this piece and this piece and this piece, but not this piece. And so one of the check, uh, checkpoints for us in our life is to say, a am I content with my lot? Am I happy with my lot? Am I, am I truly one who says this is what I am to be, a content individual, one who is able to keep the earlier commandments because I keep the last. You should not covet. Not animal, not thing, not person that doesn't belong to you. You shall not covet. You shall be content. What is the rationale? Verse 7. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. I want you to think about this. The, the old joke illustration of this is, there's never a trailer hitch on a hearse. What does that mean? I mean, you're not taking anything with you. Some cultures uh, buried their, particularly the royal people, uh, with their possessions. Egyptian pyramids. And, and sometimes they buried the live with the dead, thinking that these men would have these wives into eternity. And we don't do that. We don't bury the alive with the dead. We, we don't bury stuff, maybe some sentimental things in the casket. But other than that, we, we don't take the life savings and dump it into the casket or throw it into the urn or throw it to the sky. We, we know that we are not taking anything with us. Proverbs talks about the leech. I want you to look at this passage with me here in Proverbs chapter 30. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. Now, we, we know from many years ago, uh, my kids experienced at least, that this is a so, social, social announcement here to help you out, but uh, Goose Lake has leeches in it. And what, what are leeches? Well, actually creatures that suck blood. But we call people leeches sometimes. As a good friend of mine, at least he was a good friend, he's still lit. I haven't seen him in years, so I assume we'd still be friends. <laughs> Don't know. But every time we go out to eat as a group, uh, we, we, he would be a leech. He'd always forget his wallet. 
So it became a joke. It's like, oh, yeah, Bruce, we know you don't have any money. We'll pay for it. And it, it, we, we just laughed because we knew whether it was true or not, most likely not. He just always wanted to leech off of someone else. And so sometimes we fall into this. Sometimes we fall into this category where it's just like we just want to suck the life of other people. Or, or, or we want to look at things and we say, you know what, this is something I deserve. This is something that I need. This is something that should belong to me. And which, which helps us understand this verse that is so often misquoted. I, I want you to look very carefully at this verse with me. Verse 10. For the love of money, notice the love of, it's not just money. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, not all evil, all kinds of evil. And Colossians 3, addition to this, says greed is idolatry. Uh, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, the lack of contentment with what you have, the lack of being happy with your lot, this is truly, truly a challenge for us. Uh, whether you are just early in the stages of trying to figure out how to do life, you got your first job, you're, you're trying to figure out how to balance this out, you're in school debt, you're in whatever kind of debt, or you're later in life, and you're thinking about retirement, or you're, you're thinking about kids going off to college, or whatever it is, whatever phase it is in life, and you say, I don't know how to manage this, I don't know how to do this. Well, I want to ask you this, do you love your possessions more than your faith in God? Do you actually trust God is going to take care of these things as you trust him in what you do? Leech says give, give. And so what does the description of this look like? Verse 10, the second part. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with grief. Pierced themselves. Remember what happens to Judas? He's so disgusted with himself. So disgusted with himself that he just simply throws the coins down. Because he knows he sold his soul to the devil, that he gave up his faithfulness to the Lord, and what he has in return is worthless. Now, in the world, it had some worth, but to him, it was worthless now because he knew it wasn't worth it. And some of you have been there, uh, or you've been in a, person, a, a place where you have gone in a striving nature towards something and towards something and towards something and finally you get it and you're like that's it it's really all that promotion does in my life oh, oh i thought if i just got to that level financially i'd be content mm, not really you, you know what that's like and sometimes you say wow that was a waste of time or that was ill-placed pursuit judas experienced this Matthew 10 says this, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? And then in this passage in Timothy, he, he says that they have pierced themselves with many griefs. Again, hear the words of Jesus, Matthew 19. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. I, I talked to a person many, many years ago. They asked questions about, about giving to the church. What is it like to, to give? And I explained that the, the Old Testament talked about tithing. The New Testament mentions it. Uh, the New Testament leans more towards being generous. And in other words, tithing is a good start, but just give what God lays upon your heart. And so I was talking to him, exp explaining the tithe, and he looked at me and with a very sincere heart and much honesty. He said, you know what, Mark, that's a lot of money. The person I was talking to has lots of money. And so when I talked about the tithe, he said, that's a lot of money. And I said, well, yeah, you make a lot of money. It's all relative. It's, we all look at our lives and say, what is it that we struggle with? What is it? Maybe it's not money for you. This is what Paul mentions here. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something you're not ready to give. Maybe it's a relationship you know you shouldn't be in, but you're not ready to give that up. Maybe it's an addiction that you struggle with, but it's so comfortable you're not ready to give it up. And God says, trust me, give this to me. 
give this to me. What is, call, what is Paul calling Timothy to do? He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Do you want to know how to do this? You want to pursue the opposite of greed. You want to pursue the opposite of the lack of contentment. You want to pursue the things that will be, help you to be happy in your lot. But then we look at this and say, wow, this is difficult. They call an addiction addiction for a good reason, because you're addicted to it. It's hard to give up. It's hard to leave those relationships that are unhealthy for you, ungodly for you, because it's a relationship. You've built a relationship. It's hard to be faithful with your money because so much in life is wrapped around our financial status and our, our fi financial security. Think about that phrase, financial security. But God calls us to something higher. And Paul and el elsewhere in Scripture is saying, I want to give you the secret. I, I want you to hear what the secret is to all of this. In Philippians chapter 4, we hear these words of, of Paul, who was a very respected Hebrew leader, which meant this. He was well taken care of. He was a rabbi. He was trained by the highest of priests. He, he was a man who had no other need. He, he could have been able to do anything he needed to do financially, professionally. He was on the right track. And then God got a hold of him. And Paul began to make tents. He had to do something. He had to put life together to make it make sense. And he says this in Matthew cha or Philippians chapter 4. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I love those three words there. I know what is it to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That last verse is quoted very often. It's often misused. God probably not going to help you kick that field goal. But God is going to help you to live a life worthy of his calling. God is going to show you how to be a true man, a true woman of God. God is going to help you through the power of Christ to teach you how to be content with your lot, how to be happy with your lot, how to actually say when you wake up in the morning, God, thank you that I was able to sleep on that bed last night. God, God thank you that I have a family. God, thank you. I don't have to worry about where my next meal comes from. God, thank you for what you brought me out of. I was sitting on the plane last night. Minding my own business, had speakers on and had my Bible open. I was doing some study, and, and the woman next to me interrupted me. She said, excuse me. I said, yes, ma'am. She says, you a pastor? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, I'm going to tell you a story. I'll probably cry. And I said, please. And I won't go into all her story. It's her story. Uh, but she just got back from a trip to Florida with many family or twin sister has like eight kids she has two other family members came she showed me a picture of her herself on the phone from four weeks ago they thought she was going to die she's a stage four cancer still is four weeks ago it looked like she was going to die and she said this to me she said god gave me more time and so she was able to travel maybe the last time to go see family with her family and you could see the tears and the, and the, of, of joy as well as grief at the same time that God has given her extra time. And she said, so many people have been praying for me. And I said, add me to that list. Her name's April. Pray for April. And it was such a joy to sit there with a woman who was in stage four cancer, dying of cancer. 400 people in our nation have it. It's a very rare form of cancer. They have no idea what to do with this cancer. No biopsy needs to be taken. It's just like you have cancer. There's nothing we can do. 
palpable care. Just make it as painless as possible. She was full of joy. Full of joy. She's a, she's a gold member, so she gets free chocolates. She smiled about free chocolates. You know, just, just, take, just take joy in the small things. She's dying of stage four cancer and is excited about a chocolate. I'll tell you the truth, I like my own pay, I like my own space and planes, but man, that was a joy that she interrupted me. Because there it is, there it is, a time when we say, this is the story. So I praise God, I'm preaching on this tomorrow. God does that kind of thing. God does that kind of thing. I could preach and preach and preach, and I better not. Because we have the greatest, greatest, greatest symbol of the Lord's grace and love for us. If you want to know what it is to be content, if you want to know what it is to be happy with your lot, you need to look at what Jesus did for you. He went to the cross and died for you. He had desires of his own. Father, if you'd let this cup pass, but Father, your will be done, not mine. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, to prepare yourself for this, because we're going to go to this table, and we're going to say to ourselves, God, I thank you for this. I thank you for this. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to come to this table. If you're not a believer in Christ, this is a meal that means that we belong to Christ, and I want you to come forward and, and just come pray with me. Come talk to me. Come talk to one of our pastors. Don't come to the table. You're not ready for this. But you need to come to Jesus today. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And he raised the cup. He said, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And we're going to do that today. I want to close us in this prayer that has been written many years ago. And as we pray this together, I want us to do so with our hearts and minds ready to receive the blessing of Jesus Christ. Say this with me. We give thanks, Holy Father, for your holy name, that you've caused to dwell in our hearts. And for this knowledge and faith and immortality, that you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant, to you be the glory forever. You, almighty master, created all things for your name's sake and gave food and drink to humans to enjoy. so They might give you thanks. But to us, you have graciously given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through your servant. Above all, we give thanks to you because you are mighty, to you be glory forever. Remember your church, Lord, to deliver it from all evil, and to make it perfect in your love, and from the four winds gather the sanctified church into your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and the glory forever. May grace come, and may this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not, let him repent. Mm -hmm.